Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar series, The Power of Energy Efficiency. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, oh, one second, someone just told me I wasn't on full screen. So I'll just adjust this. All right, so my name is Caroline Milne. I am Director of Communications and Marketing at Jewel Assets Europe, and I'll be hosting this webinar series. And I'll also be presenting on the following two webinars as well. So before we get into the agenda and the presentations, I'd just like to go through a few quick housekeeping items. We'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of this session. So please do feel free to send us your questions throughout the webinar. We'll do our best to get all to get all of your questions, and we should. And if we run out of time, we're also happy to follow up with you one on one. And if you have any any questions at any time during the live session, please type it in the questions box near the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you can also send us messages in the chat section directly. And we'll be sharing the slides and recordings of the webinar following the live presentation. And the slides are also attached as a handout that you can find in your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. So you can download them right away if you like. And finally, you'll receive a questionnaire after the webinar. Uh, it's related mostly to the content we're discussing today. And if you have one to two minutes, we would really appreciate that you take the time to fill it out as we're always looking to receive constructive feedback. Now, before getting into the introduction of the entire series and the agenda, I would just like to say a few words um, really of thanks to the Irish Green Building Council, as well as the UK Green Building Council, who really supported in promoting these webinars. Um, the IGBC has especially been instrumental in providing feedback on content, and we really appreciated this um, or developed this series with the members of the Green Building Councils in mind. And I'd like to just give the floor over to Marion Jamais from the Irish Green Building Council to say just a few words of introduction as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Caroline, and um, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, as Caroline has just said, uh, I'm Marion Jamais, I'm Business Development Manager at the Irish Green Building Council, and we are particularly, we are really delighted, I suppose, to support uh, Jules Asset Europe in launching this new webinar series, um, The Power of Energy Efficiency. I mean, I suppose because it's something that we really strongly believe in um, as an organization, and we have many projects to support energy efficiency in the new and existing building sectors. Um, saying that, it's also really clear to us that given the scale of the challenge uh, in Ireland and in Europe that we can't, um, that level, I suppose, of um, retrofit of energy efficiency that we need uh, without clearly increasing uh, finance um, for it. So I suppose ourselves as Irish Green Building Council, we do a bit of work to support this finance, especially um, through uh, green mortgages um, so and lower interest rate, I suppose, promoting lower interest rate for um, energy efficiency. But that's clearly not enough. Um, and I really would like to thank uh, Jules at Europe and Caroline for organizing this series because I think it's very much needed. And I'm really looking forward to um, learning more um, during this series on, on this alternative form of finance. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Marion. That was a very kind introduction. Um, so quickly, I'll just go through the agenda and then I will say a few words as well before we get into the presentations on um, really the why behind this series and what the name of it means, <laughs> the power of energy efficiency. So first on the agenda, if my, there we go. Uh, so I'll be giving the introduction. Uh, following the introduction, we'll have my colleague uh, Benedetta Frizo Bellamo, Director of Sales at Jules Assets Europe, who will be presenting on crowdfunding, followed by Christina Klimovich, Director of Marketing and Communications at GNE Finance, and she'll be presenting on property assessed clean energy, an innovative financing method for the residential sector. So before we get into so just a little bit of background, first of all, um, because some of you may know dual assets, some of you may not know us, uh, but really why we wanted to do these, this series in general comes a lot down to really what our work is and who we are uh, ourselves. 
So we started as a dedicated fund for small energy efficiency and demand side projects uh, in the US. We saw firsthand what it takes to develop these markets and just looking to enable small to medium sized businesses succeed, succeed developing and launching their projects. In the US, we launched an ESCO, Jewel Smart, which develops and runs these projects now. And we've also developed another business unit called Jewel Community, which has been leading the community energy movement in New York State. And it's something that is, I'm very passionate about, and I'd love to speak with you about it separately. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, however, our core activities in Europe are related to financing sustainable energy projects. As a team, we act as a conduit to finance and are really looking to act as the marketplace in Europe where project developers and investors can meet and make transactions in a um, you know, faster way than might otherwise take place. And really so that both also get the best deal that they're, they really, the idea is really to facilitate the whole process. Um, we've developed this model through uh, the CIF H2020 project, uh, which we were the coordinator of which uh, we developed a platform called eQuad, which acts as a bridge between energy services and the finance community. And so, yeah, our mission is really to ultimately bridging this gap. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna, sk I'll skip through this slide. This is more informational, but it will be, it might be useful for you later on as you're going through the uh, downloaded slides. So the question I'd really like to ask is why the power of energy efficiency? Um, what is the point of this series and what are the topics that we're looking to cover? So I'd like to just start with a small anecdote. Um, a few months ago, I believe it was in October 2018, in the wake of the publication of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, I was having a discussion with some, someone that um, many of you probably know. His name is Tony Day. He's the executive director of the International Energy Research Center uh, based in Cork, Ireland. And we were lamenting the urgency of tackling climate change and the fact that many countries are very much off target to meeting their climate change goals, Ireland being one of them. And Tony said to me with you know, great fervor, I just wish that people would understand the transformative power of energy efficiency and the important role it plays in combating climate change. There's so much more we can do right now and we're not doing it and it's taking far too long. And I really liked what he said. I really liked this idea of the power of energy efficiency as a hook and something for us to keep in, in our minds, um, especially in the wider energy context. All too often, energy efficiency is treated as a nice luxury item, an extra, an afterthought. And having spoken with many people working on the ground, developing and implementing projects, one thing I know for sure now is that energy efficiency presents many challenges. Um, it's hard to sell, it's hard if you're an SME contractor competing against larger energy companies, it's hard to gain the client's trust, it's hard to find project finance that supports your business and your sales message. So that's really what this uh, series is about. At Jewel, we really believe that leveraging financing now and getting projects implemented is one of the quickest ways to combating climate change and to growing the green economy. And the numbers don't lie. So just to you know, back this up with a little bit of some facts, um, achieving what we need to achieve collectively is an enormous undertaking. Um, the European Commission estimates that the mobilization of an extra 177 billion euros from public and private investment sources is needed annually from 20 to 20, 2021 to 2030 to reach our 2030 climate and energy targets. That's an absolutely astronomical sum. And at Jewel, our key question as a company that we always keep at the forefront of our mind is what if all viable projects were financed and actually implemented? And what if that happened sooner rather than later? So I took a look at the registration list and given the fact that both the UK and the Irish uh, Green Building Councils promoted this, we do have a majority of Irish and UK um, audience today. And these two markets are very good examples of both carbon emissions reduction potential and market opportunity. So in Ireland, for example, uh, the country is off track to meeting its climate reduction targets for 2020. Um, according to SEAI, Ireland has a 3 billion euro investment potential in energy efficiency, 
which could deliver a net savings of 8 billion euro. So this is the equivalent to nearly a quarter of primary energy demand in 2013. So that's nearly 35 terawatts, which is more than what's needed to fulfill Ireland's 2020 carbon targets. So the potential is massive. Um, in the UK, the story is slightly different. The energy efficiency market has grown ste steadily since 1990. Um, however, a recent Navigant study shows that the total market size was 349 pound, million pounds in 2017, which is considered a relatively small size considering the overall size of the economy. Um, also, estimates by base indicate that if the UK energy services market is to make a strong contribution to delivering its fifth carbon budget for non-domestic buildings alone, it'll have to grow at an annual rate of almost 20%, reaching an annual revenue of almost 5 billion in 2032. So that's a substantial amount of growth which is required to meet its targets. And the UK is off track still to meeting its 2030 targets for the residential sector as of right now. And fuel poverty is on the rise. So not only are we facing an urgent existential need to meet our EU climate reduction targets, but there's a huge market opportunity on both sides. So to sum up this introduction and to look at what you can expect in the coming presentations and in the coming webinars, uh, at Joule Assets, one thing that we've seen in our experience is that it takes projects quite a long time to get off the ground and the barriers for these are complex. Well, we are unable to address all of these barriers. Our area of expertise and our interest really lies in the idea of expediting the finance process. And it seems that there is a lot of confusion around the types of finance available and when it's best to use them for what projects. So ultimately, we want to simplify this. We want to do our part to speed up the process and to provide the knowledge that we've gained uh, to those of you who are working on projects or who are somehow vested in this process. So the aims of this series is ultimately to present our knowledge. And we're looking to especially look at um, helping you, the audience, walk away with a better understanding of the various forms of financing, including on bill, on tax and EPC to look at where the money is actually coming from and what the implications of this may be. And finally, to look at the types of finance that are actually available for which projects. So this last topic would really be the focus of our last webinar on April 17th. And we hope to discuss on versus off balance sheet finance, look at the cost of finance of different available funding and how those deals might be structured. So uh, here are some sources for some of the things I quoted earlier, but. Uh, you can always look at those in your free time later on. Uh, and please do make sure to register for the upcoming webinars in this series. Uh, you can, the links are directly in the handout that you'll receive, and you can also check our website uh, to register. Um, thank you again for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and now I'll hand over the mic to Benedetta. Okay, hi, I'm just sharing my screen. Um, thank you, Caroline, for the great introduction and uh, all the attendees for uh, joining us today. Um, as, as Caroline mentioned, uh, the way we want to start this webinar series today is um, by giving you um, a first general introductory overview of the finance available for sustainable energy projects, and in particular um, of three um, financing structures that are less known in Europe sometimes, but have a, an, a great potential to boost this um, 180 billion euros investment that Caroline mentioned uh, that we need to reach our climate goals. So before I do that, I'll just uh, give you a quick description of our equal platform and services. Um, as many of you know already, our goal as a company is to bridge this finance gap, so to help developers overcome the, the main barriers uh, that they have to this, their sales goals, that is selling energy efficiency as a service without having the project investment as a, as a burden for themselves or for their end clients. And um, how do we do that? Um, we do that by providing a preliminary financial analysis uh, of projects. 
uh, we provide third, this third party financial valuation and also technical if needed. Uh, we um, give the access to performance insurance through a quicker and cheaper mechanism on the platform. Uh, we do that by offering also an international uh, project certification in partnership with the Investor Confidence Projects, ICP. Um, there's also um, a step on the preliminary due diligence, so projects, financials uh, and contracts as well, from provided by Jewel Assets, by us. And finally, uh, and, and most importantly, with the introduction of these projects to our investor partners, where we assist uh, the developer throughout the journey until the, the very end, the handshake with the investor. So, um, why, um, why is that, uh, why is equal important in this process? Um, as, as you can see here, I've um, I've outlined the mere barriers to, to sustainable energy finance. And uh, as Ma Caroline mentioned earlier, ECOD is, is particularly important because of the way the sustainable energy projects market is currently structured, which is made of, is made of uh, small and medium projects. And seemingly these projects cannot access appropriate off-balance sheet finance. And so they impede their, their, these developers in their growth. And um, here, as main barriers, you can see, for instance, well, the first, that is size and scalability of projects, uh, a high performance risk for investors. Uh, there's also a, a very strong lack of standardization of projects across, uh, but also within uh, European countries. Uh, there's a lack of uh, financial knowledge on the developer side as well. And uh, of course, the balance sheet burden that these developers have when when uh, when uh, they enter into debt to finance these projects. So, how do we address these barriers through equal? Well, first, um, we do that uh, with the creation of umbrella, umbrella contracts to bundle together projects with equal uh, equal capabilities. Uh, we support the creation of SPV structures for these projects. Uh, we again offer. Um, performance risk mitigation through performance insurance when necessary. Um, we also support the cor correct development of EPC contracts when these are the chosen uh, contractual structure for uh, an effective um, and safe uh, uh, performance-based project. But um, finally, we uh, what we really what we really here to talk about and what we, we support uh, is the development of uh, innovative financing solutions uh, that come from different different finance sources that are better able to fit the specific needs of project developers, but also of their end clients. So, what are these um, finance sources uh, and types? Mm. This slide is, is just a visual overview of the main financing types, uh, sources and forms available for uh, energy efficiency and uh, small uh, renewables projects. Um, I'm showing this only because what, what we realized this past year when we, we explored the European energy efficiency market is that contractors and clients are not really fully uh, aware of the options they have. But also, um, but also, they're not really aware of what type of projects are better suited for these options. So it's really important for us through this webinar series to uh, to to uh, finally build this bridge, uh, knowledge bridge as well between co from between contractors and, and investors. So uh, of course, there's a first distinction in finance types, which is equity and debt that are. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive in, in project finance. Uh, they can come from different sources, but also sometimes from the same financial institution. Uh, these sources are banks, which are the classic source for debt, uh, investment funds that usually um, offer equity, uh, equity for projects, but also when we have larger investors that they can also off offer some debt options. Uh, uh, we have high net worth individuals who are um, but they're less, of course, than investment funds, but they're usually uh, more interesting in terms of timing because they're faster and more flexible than, than more structured funds. And finally, we have uh, the crowd, which is what we're going to talk, uh, talk about today and uh, which works through um, specific, specific online uh, crowdfunding platforms.
um, as a form of, I'm sorry, the PowerPoint starting by itself. <laughs> as a form of finance, we have then uh, EPCs uh, on bill financing and on tax financing, which uh, of course are not all the options available and it's important to state it, but they're definitely the uh, most innovative and also appropriate for uh, the small and medium uh, sustainable energy projects we are we are addressing here today. So um, let's start from on bill financing, which is uh, similar, quite similar to on tax financing, as they are both uh, uh, financing forms that are not a burden for uh, the people, the companies involved, as they are attached to a property in the case of non-tax financing, or to uh, the energy bills in case of uh, on bill financing. Mm, these options are currently not in place uh, uh, in Europe. We, we are at the moment developing, of course, a pilot on tax program with Europace, and, and Christina, we will tell you all about that after my presentation, while on bill financing is, uh, is not there yet. Um, mm, we are working on that through uh, educational activities with the European Commission as well to support uh, member states to structure these programs. And uh, we are hopeful that they'll, they'll use this soon. Uh, the coming months will be key because member states will work on implementing, implementing the new European Performance of Buildings directing, Directive. So fingers crossed for that. Um, why? Why are these these options important? It's it's because they're not just they're not simply financing financing options for contractors. It's, be, it's because they, they also allow um, they, they yes they allow contractors to sell their projects more easily, but they also uh, open the market to those end customers that are usually left out because they cannot afford to take on more loans, such as uh, low-income houses and, and small and medium enterprises. Um, but let's go to let's go more in depth to on bill financing. Um, on bill is with, with with on bill financing we have a, a loan that is offered to a customer for energy efficiency improvements for for their buildings which is repaid directly through this customer's electricity bill. So the repayment of this loan is not attached to the tenant or the building owner, but it's, it's attached to the meter of the building and as to the electricity bill itself. Um, how does it work? So um, it works, um, we, we, have a, we have a contractor who audits the building and offers uh, the energy efficiency service. The customer then, uh, if, if the customer accepts it, um, they apply to the program. And if they, they're, they're in line with their, the program's requirements, uh, there is a third party lender or the utility in some cases that pays from the uh, pays upfront for the project. So that customers can start enjoying the benefits uh, straight away. Um, on, on the other hand, what we have here is um, we have now on, at the same time we have um, um, in this with with this mechanism we have uh, customers that do pay the added cost of the loan through their bill, but at the same time uh, the electricity part of the bill will be re reduced by the electricity ma measures. So the two uh, the two parts go and balance themselves. Um, we have several success, success stories in the U.S., mainly, mainly for the residential sector, but also for uh, commercial and, and industrial projects. And um, yes, they, were, they effectively processed around $2 billion of loans. So um, what we see here is um, an outline of the main benefits. We have first for investors, uh, better loan performance. Uh, the U U.S. example had a very low default rate, for instance, and shows that people tend to pay their electricity bills and are thus uh, reliable customers for investors. Um, on bill is also very effective to solve the, the classic split incentive problem, where we have the owner of the building that who doesn't uh, want to pay for a project that brings benefits uh, only to the tenant, and the tenant on the other side who doesn't want to engage in projects that might um, last longer than, than their stay in the building. So yes, with 
this structure uh, with on-bill financing, the tenant can pay uh, for the project himself, and most importantly, uh, the tenant can stop paying if he moves out out of the building. That's why we say we talk about we say here that it's uh, transferable because the payment is attached to the meter of the house and it passes on to the new tenant in case it changes. Um, finally, as and as mentioned earlier, uh, on bill offers access to a broader audience, in, part in particular the less less uh, wealthy citizens. Um, we have then crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding uh, is very attractive in Europe. Um, it's uh, moving fast across member states, and we have uh, today around uh, 30, um, I would say 29 crowdfunding platforms active in energy, pro in energy projects, and around uh, 800 projects that have been successfully financed between uh, 2012 and 2018. So um, how does this work in, in, in details? Um, crowdfund crowdfunding, of course, is a source of finance, as we mentioned earlier during the slide. Uh, it could be equity or debt, where the money comes from small investors who invest uh, uh, through a certain platform that selects opportunities for them. It has some very interesting benefits uh, for uh, all the parties involved, for investors, for instance, because it increases their risk tolerance by offering a greater uh, portfolio diversification in small amounts. It supports uh, responsible investments because investors uh, have a greater control uh, over the projects and, and their results, and also tend uh, these investors tend to participate in projects that have a positive impact on, on the environment and their communities. It also makes um, investments uh, faster, thanks to a standardized online process and a simple and, and simple financing structures that, that non-finance people can easily understand. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's so much more than just a financial tool because it gives citizens the chance not only to benefit from the energy transition in terms of um, environment, uh, health, uh, job creation, etc., but also to gain money and become active players in this energy transition. So yeah, well, finally, for on the contractor side, which is very important, crowdfunding is is really useful in uh, in terms of sales and marketing as well, as it helps. Um, it helps them uh, to get known within their communities and thus reach out to new potential end customers eventually. And I will I will show a, a case study after this slide. Um, here, for instance, we have an, a very very positive experience in Italy. Um, uh, so, what what we have here is. Um, um yes I'm, I'm sorry i was just uh, checking the slide was not stuck um, you can see a case study of um successful building renovation project in italy that was financed through uh, an equity crowd equity crowdfunding platform uh, which is in our network the project involved um renovation the renovation of a vo volleyball stadium near um, the city of milan the, to the total project size uh, was um uh, 330,000 euros, where 65,000 were, were provided by the crowd, with uh, yeah the technology involved were heating, lighting, uh, rooftop insulation, and the finance campaign lasted around two or three months, and where 18 investors uh, participated. Mm, this, as I, as I was uh, saying earlier, is also a very good example of how crowdfunding can be useful for the uh, ESCO sales as well. Uh, in this case, one of the investors uh, was uh, a large building buildings owner, and through by participating to the investment, he had the chance to appreciate the contractor's work and, and uh, the finance structures as well, and became eventually uh, a client himself uh, after this this positive positive experience. So it's it's a, it's a sort of way to make uh, that doesn't work in every in every case. Of course, there are large uh, crowdfunding platforms that work also across countries, but it can also be particularly for uh, sustainable energy projects a way to. Um, put um, communities together in a, in a more local 
way. So here we have just a quick note in case you have some uh, energy efficiency or small renewable energy projects and you want to know if there's a finance available for them. Just You can just click on the link here when you download the slide on, on our website, you can access our uh, project survey. Um, enter the information and uh, we'll let you know straight away if uh, you fit for uh, you fit our investors investment criteria and here there's just a recap on our recent publications uh, if you want to learn more uh, more uh, about us or our research uh, on, on the sustainable energy finance market and of course our two next webinar coming please uh, register and, and join us again uh, for the next uh, episode on, on EPC. Um, well, thank you. And I'll just uh, um, leave the floor to Christina. Hello. Thank you very much, Benedetta. And this is Christina, and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I would especially like to thank Dual Assets Europe for launching these new webinar series. Um, this is absolutely needed for the industry, and I'm really glad to participate. Um, so I'm with GNE Finance, and GNE Finance provides um, financing solutions for home renovation. And Europace, which logo you see on the right hand side, is our flagship project that focuses on home renovation using a very specific financing tool um, which came from the US. It's called PACE financing. So I'll mostly focus on um, this particular project today. Ah. So, but first of all, let's set it up from a policy perspective a bit. And our view is that home renovation is not just private business, but it's a public priority. Because in, if we want to reach climate and energy goals, we need to be a lot more ambitious about home renovation. And we need to also provide tools to all Europeans to upgrade their homes and make the process easier. We also view that the public sector plays an absolutely key role in enabling, but also supporting, and in some cases, even administering home renovation programs. But they need very specific tools for that. And these tools should be scalable, and these tools should also be equitable, which means they should be available to all Europeans. Um, and they should provide affordability, also long terms. What do I mean by that? It's specifically that the term of the financing should align well with the useful life of the improvement. There should also be ease of access and digital and fast approvals. Because let's face it, home renovation is already complex enough and it's a time consuming process. We should really try to make it as easier and as faster and more reliable as possible. So I'll speak uh, briefly about on-bill financing that Benedetta uh, just presented to us. Um, and I absolutely agree with everything she said. And uh, just as a very quick um, kind of an overview, um, the utility, of course, plays an absolutely key role, just as Benedetta mentioned. And then the financing can be provided by either the private sector or by even the utility itself. So really, the way we see on-bill financing, it's, uh, it separates um, that debt from an individual and attaches it to um, a bill, essentially. So it's uh, it's breaking one of those important barriers of energy efficiency. So we're providing 100% financing, and then it's repaid on a typical utility bill where individuals can actually see the difference of energy costs versus repayment. Um, and uh, one of the on-bill financing programs that comes to mind is the Green Deal um, in the UK. And I'll just want to briefly mention that um, the program was not very successful, but we really don't believe that it's because of the on-bill financing structure. The on-bill financing structure works well. It's simply that the administration and the design of the program could have been improved. So I really want to kind of uh, not connect um, the relative failure of the Green Deal with the on-bill financing, which uh, um, has been successful in the US and can be successful in other areas of Europe as well. So after the slide, um, I'll just uh, complicate the picture a bit. And and now we're talking about um, home-based financing or property attached financing, or what sometimes is referred to as on-tax financing. 
So the difference you see here is that at the top, instead of the utility, we have a home renovation program and a local government. And um, again, we're also separating financing from an individual and attaching it to a property, which creates certain security for the investor. And also it's a more convenient method of financing for a homeowner who can resell the property and leave that home without having to repay the full investment. So the story is fairly, um, fairly similar to the on-bill financing where a homeowner um, is receiving 100% uh, funding and then he or she renovates their home with the help of the energy services contractor and then repays um, via a special charge attached to um, either a property tax as it's done in the US, hence the name, the on-tax financing, or a different type of charge or uh, property related tax. And this is the model we're focusing on in Europe. But uh, um, on tax financing or PACE financing is really a flexible tool. And there are a number of models that are exist out there where the local government and the home renovation program, those are the two bubbles that you see at the top, could also be um, a one entity. They don't have to necessarily be separate. So just after a very quick overview, let's look at the two main pillars of Europace. And it's really two things. On the one side, it's affordable and scalable financing. And on the other side, it's technical assistance. And uh, we believe that financing without technical assistance cannot meet the goals that we need to meet because home renovation is complicated, it's time consuming, and people are usually not experts on uh, what elements to choose, how to do it, when to do it. So we believe that having that technical assistance or very people-centric assistance is absolutely key. So I'll say a couple of words about financing first. Um, well, first of all, we're building very strongly on the US model of PACE financing, and uh, we would like to provide 100% financing from private capital and it will be long term up to 25 years but it will also be very much aligned with the useful life of um, an improvement and it's attached to a property not a person thus it can transfer to a new owner upon sale and uh, europace financing can fund uh, anything uh, from uh, energy efficiency renewable energy to water conservation specific measures uh, will be determined by each um, local city or region depending on um, where we are geographically and what improvements are needed in that area and um, and more and so this and more is also a very interesting element because it could actually mean that europeans could also fund accessibility improvements to a building and also full um, renovations of a building including a facade including stairs elevators and other elements that may be needed as we're learning that those elements are very much needed in multifamily buildings in Spain so um, homes apartments and uh, multifamily buildings are eligible at the moment we're not focusing on commercial at this stage and in terms of the people-centric approach that um, I just mentioned on the previous slide, uh, what Europace brings to the table is really the logistical and technical supports throughout the process. So we'll help homeowners understand what needs to be done, but also when it needs to be done in a sense that uh, we want to avoid having piecemeal improvements that then if uh, in hindsight, if you were going to renovate your whole house, you might have chose a very different improvement if you knew what else you might have needed. So in that sense, we'll be offering home improvement packages that will directly align with people's needs, but also with the needs of the home. We'll work with trained and qualified contractors, and there will be certain quality controls after each project. And energy experts will, um, coordinate between the contractor, homeowner, and the program itself. Energy experts are those independent, um, independent folks who will actually help to assess um, the works proposed by the contractor, the costs, and the quotes proposed by the contractor, and really provide people that reliability um, and security.
And uh, on the right hand side, it's a very brief uh, customer journey. Um, I wasn't intending for you to read through the whole thing, but the point is that we're really trying to minimize the so-called touch points with citizens. So to make the process as streamlined as possible, because we're keeping in mind that Europe is, after all, it's a business venture. We intend for it to be scalable and uh, easily replicable in other areas outside of Spain as well. Um, so a couple words on the contractors. Europace uh, builds um, quite a bit on the PACE financing model where the contractors play a very key role. In fact, they're the main sales force in the US. So we'll also train contractors and uh, um, contractors should agree to all the guidelines, including the customer protection policies. But in the Europe pace, we specifically will have a slightly different, um, slightly different flavor because we'll focus on the multi-measure contractors who can actually provide certain renovation packages rather than focusing on single measure improvements as it has been done in some of the US programs. And plus we have the additional element of the energy expert for that um, particular personalized advice. Um, so in a nutshell, in terms of program operation, um, let's look at the city of Olot. It's a city in Spain, so the city is right in the center of it. Then g and &E Finance will provide private capital to actually fund home renovation. Then the local nonprofit program administrator will administer the whole process and ensure that there is a full coordination between the rest of the bodies and the contractors and energy experts will be the ones actually doing the work. So that's um, the program operations in a nutshell. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about it in the Q&A session as well. Um, so I'll say a few words about the actual Europace project, which is a Horizon 2020 funded initiative. And uh, we're glad to be a partner with Jewel Assets Europe on this as well, as you can see on the right hand side. And uh, there are really three elements to the project. First of all, we want to assess the market, um, look at all EU28 and see which countries are most suitable for Europace, given its very specific structure and attachment to a property. Then we're working to deploy Europace in Spain and specifically in the city of Olot and scale it to Europe with four leader cities. Let's look at the first step. Um, so we've conducted the step one analysis and uh, we looked at legal suitability um, and uh, municipal capacity enforceability um, of EU28. And we determined that the following countries, oh, sorry about that, that the following countries are the most suitable for Europace at the moment. Um, and the second step of the analysis, oh, and I should mention that the report was actually published uh, today. So if you get a chance to go to europace2020.eu, you'll be able to download the full step one analysis of legal suitability of EU28. And uh, then we'll look at those seven selected countries and we'll identify which ones are more, uh, have more market potential for us to then choose for leader cities from. So, um, the second part of the uh, project is to deploy Europace in Spain, and here we'll be working with uh, the city of Olot, which is shown on the map at the bottom of the slide. Um, Olot is located in Catalonia, um, just an hour drive away from Barcelona. It's uh, a small city, but uh, it has 34,000 of inhabitants, so it's the right size for the very first Europace program because we're able to work very closely with the local government and design the program that fits the needs of the citizens. And since we're talking about the citizens, just a few months ago, we've conducted um, a survey of more than 2,000 uh, phone calls were done. And uh, what we learned is, uh, oh, sorry, but that may not be surprising to many of you, but uh, as you can see, the 70% of the respondents of the survey said that what prevents them from um, doing home renovation and its actual lack of financing lack of technical knowledge and complexity of the works. And those are exactly the three elements that we would like to um, provide and simplify with Europace. So it's simply a really good confirmation that what we're doing is exactly what citizens need. Um, we've also learned that uh, you can see that 56% of the respondents mentioned that um, they've renovated their homes to improve their family well-being 
So this is, again, another very important people-centric perspective that uh, people don't buy energy efficiency. They also are, uh, don't buy financing. What they do want to improve is health, well-being of their family, um, and other more emotionally charged benefits. And, uh, of course, financing plays a very important role to it, but we want to broaden the story a bit with Europace here. Um, so the last... Um, step of the Europace project will be to choose four leader cities from the following seven countries. And um, I'd like to invite cities to reach out to us if they think that um, they would be a good candidate for Europace implementation. And throughout the next two years of the project, we'll work closely with them to help them set up Europace programs, uh, programs that provide financing and technical assistance and help attach uh, financing to the property based on local legal and fiscal rules. So essentially, um, for us, it's very clear that Europace will not work the same way in every country, and it will be um, slightly different, but as long as it provides uh, security and a certain collection or payment mechanism, it will meet um, the needs of the investors and also the citizens. Um, and um, I'd like to um, mention that on June 19th, we'll be holding the so-called Europe Summit, um, Investing for Cities in Brussels, and more information is coming soon. Um, just to summarize, um, comfortable and healthy homes should really be a reality for all European citizens, and we're here to make this complex process simpler, faster, and more reliable by providing affordable financing and also uh, by providing that people-centric approach. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Christina. Apologies for the little delay in getting my microphone back on. Um, so thank you both uh, for those presentations. They were really useful. Christina, I especially appreciated learning more myself about PACE because there are some parts for me that are a bit fuzzy. And this was a very, very thorough overview. And I know myself and I think from Jewel's side, the more we learn about uh, on-bill financing and PACE, the more we're convinced that it's really the future for residential projects and communities really need to get on board with this. And I'm just really excited about what you guys are doing. And yeah, so thank you again. Um, I have a few questions that have come in and please in the audience, feel free to ask a few more questions. Uh, I'll get started now with the first ones. So Christina, this question is for you. How is Europace different from other home renovation programs? Thank you very much for the question, um, Caroline. Um, well, there are a couple of elements um, that differentiate it from home renovation programs. And the first one is that um, it is, of course, the so-called one-stop shop that, that's been used as a buzzword uh, quite a bit around Europe. Uh, but Europace provides financing that is attached to a property and not an individual. So it's 100% financing that's provided from private sources. Um, so it's not bank financing. And um, it stays with the property. So if the homeowner leaves the property, the financing, the new homeowner assumes the repayment and continues on repaying. So that's in terms of the financing side. And then on the technical assistance side, uh, we intend to make um, Europace as people-centric as possible and as a simple process as possible, building on the U.S. experience where um, to this date the market is about six billion dollars um, worth of uh, completed and funded projects and such success definitely um, is owed to this people-centric approach um, that um, connect essentially the renovation itself to life events that people may have, like somebody's having a baby or an older relative is moving in the house, things like that. So we, we want to capitalize on all of these elements. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for Benedetta related to crowdfunding. Um, what is the average size of a project to apply for crowdfunding and what is the contractual structure for investors? Um, well, 
there's not really a, an average um, an average size for crowdfunding. Also, we have to say that it's 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 a very new structure, so it's hard to make uh, to have uh, history historical track uh, historical track record. Um, the projects can really vary from a couple of thousand euros to a million euro, but um, that really also depends on the well. For instance, on the contractor contractor's willingness to participate uh, in the investment in the in investment himself, and uh, and thus to the to the to the size to the size of the project that we are able to offer to uh, to the crowd investors, because it's important for that for them there are also good good returns in a way. For instance, in the in the in, in the case that we were yeah we, we were discussing earlier the equity part was uh, the equity part that was required was uh, uh, only 65k for a single project but but the crowd uh, can also finance uh, several small projects bundled together on, on in the same SPV. Um, I don't have a case study for energy efficiency but for instance the same Italian uh, crowdfunding platform that I mentioned earlier, financed uh, um, in uh, in central Italy uh, a bundle of 10 charging stations for electric electric vehicles uh, across the country so uh, the total value so the, the total value was larger and, and investors had more interesting returns so it really depends also on the technology if it's uh, energy efficiencies if it's renewables it really depends in terms of contractual structures um, it's usually quite simple. Uh, at least the examples that we have is they usually involve uh, investors who simply buy shares of the SPV of the project. So in the case study, the, the case study in Italy, for instance, uh, there were these uh, 18 investors involved. Some were individuals and, and others uh, were companies and they bought 34% uh, the of the shares of the project SPV. So it's this is the usual structure, but there's there's um, it, it's it's quite open. This is just an easier way, let's say. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for Christina. Um, how would how does Europace deal with the debt limits of cities due to Maastricht Maastricht rules? Um, so that's a very good question. So Europace, similar to Pace financing in the US, doesn't actually consolidate as debt for municipality. So um, while the municipality would and could handle the collection of the charges in the same manner as they may be handling the collection of property related taxes, the collection in this money is segregated from the municipal's income and budget. So essentially, the municipality functions as the so-called conduit for private money. Um, at the same time, if the municipality desires to provide its own financing, it can be combined with the private financing as well, or with certain public funds that can be given as subsidies to low-income population. So essentially, um, the idea of Europace is that we're providing private financing, and it flows through the municipality, through this collection mechanism, and goes directly to the private investor, but it doesn't consolidate as um, liability for the local authority in any way. Thank you. Uh, finally, I have a question for Benedetta related to, I believe it was crowdfunding. Why would a utility take on the client credit risk? Um, uh, yeah, I think it's it's related to on bill to on bill financing. Um, well. It's well. First, first, it's it doesn't have necessarily to be a utility as uh, the, the financing party. Uh, we experiences in the U.S. and also some some uh, tests uh, in Europe show that maybe uh, it, a third party uh, investor uh, works better in some cases. But anyways, in in what one of the strengths of uh, on bill loan programs is really that. They can go outside traditional underwriting standards and uh, and and so offer their programs to a larger audience, uh, because in particular, for instance, uh, instead of mm, the, mm, normally what 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 they would normally normally use would be uh, bank statements or you know balance sheet, 
uh, checks. Uh, in these cases, they will use um, history of utility bills payments that, that is uh, often used as a criteria, as criteria for assessing the credit worthiness. And that really opens the, opens the market to, um, to, to individuals and companies that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't wouldn't fit normally with a normal credit check. Okay, thank you, answer. thank you. I have just we have a couple more minutes, so I'll just close off with a couple last questions as well. Uh, this one would be for Christina. Uh, so experience in France indicates that the total cost of facilitating the renovation process. So the pre-feasibility study, coaching through procurement of contractors and post-renovation controls and follow-up ranges from between 3,500 euros and 4,500 euros. Is this cost also recovered by on-bill financing or is this dealt with separately? Yeah, it's a very good question. And all these services that you mentioned, um, exactly that's uh, how Energy Positif and Picardy Pass has been operating as well, because these are quite important elements to actually make the right decision and uh, uh, make sure that the project is what people expect it to be. It's the audit, it's uh, making sure that the contractors work well together, and we view it as a service. So we also want to offer it to homeowners as an additional service. So we're not just providing financing, but we're providing these tools um, through the service that will allow homeowners to make get the best out of the financing and um, get the home that they um, want and deserve. And uh, the service, we intend to um, sign a, an agreement with the homeowner about uh, this additional service that they would like to take on. And then the cost of this service will be rolled into financing at the end of the project. Um, so in terms of the numbers and actually how much it would cost in, in particular in Spain, I can share the numbers at the moment, but I definitely encourage you to keep in touch and uh, see, uh, check our website as well, because we'll be sharing a lot of that information once the pilot gets rolling. Um, but that's why I was also mentioning earlier that we intend to minimize those so-called touch points with the customer to minimize those costs as much as possible and to also increase the, co the coordination on the back end with contractors and other entities. Thank you. Great. Uh, we just have time for one short final question. Uh, Benedetta, this would go to you. What is the return and payback expected for investors in crowdfunding? Um, well, as I said earlier, it's it's a bit early to to have a, an in-depth uh, analysis, but uh, la the last publications shows that returns are around uh, four and nine percent for uh, um, sustainable energy projects. So um, yeah, they're quite interesting, and as of course, as I said earlier as well, the the larger uh, the larger. Uh, the SPV the better. So if it's if we have more projects to bundle together, um, it's 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 going to be more interesting for the crowd as well, and it's going to bring more returns. Great, thank you for answering that. Uh, well, we are right at the hour mark, or just about. Uh, so I will let you all get on with your day, and thank you so much for staying on with us and listening to our presentations. Uh, please do uh, visit our website, um, it's eu.julassets.com, or you can find the links as well in the handout here, so you can sign up for the next webinars. Uh, the next one will be on the 28th of March, I believe, or the 27th, you might have to check the website again. Uh, at end of March will be the next one, we'll be discussing uh, EPC in more detail, we'll look at the business case for EPC, uh, the case from the municipal perspective, and finally the financiers case, uh, looking at risks and financial models for financiers. Uh, the final web webinar then will be on April 17th, and we will be going in more depth again, looking on when, in what case is on balance sheet better than off balance sheet, for example, and what different types of finance are available now in the market in general for various types of projects, and really going through investor criteria in more detail. Um, so we'd love to have you and please do feel free to get in touch. We will in any case be sending you the slides and um, the webinar recording after the webinar. Um, and yeah, as always, uh, we're very happy to speak anytime. So just uh, send us an email or give us a ring and we'll, we'll look forward to uh, staying in touch. Thank you very much.